What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I, I've been waiting for... Is it safe to say four years for this episode to happen? Yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. We have a very special guest on the show today. You'll find out who. He's kind of famous. have a very important person as your guest and you have such a long intro sometimes you get very nervous because there was almost a minute of no interaction <laughs> <laughs> it's just me staring at you and you staring at me i know and it's like oh yeah all right so what do we do like do we keep quiet <laughs> ladies and gentlemen uh we have a very special uh, guest on the show i think we've always uh basically exchanged uh, yep. messages online That's true. it's more of like well, sometimes okay he double taps my picture it's like whoa <laughs> and I double tap his picture. Oh. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, he replies my messages. Oh, but we have him on the show, ladies and gentlemen. We have Said Sadik. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's a yes. pleasure. Yeah. So okay. So do most people have to so, like call you YB? No, definitely not. Call me Said or Sadik. Okay. It's much easier. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's so funny that um I have you on the show uh and a lot of friends of mine who are probably mutual friends of yours as well. Uh, I believe you work with Ken, you work with Vinesh, uh, you work with uh, these friends. They're yep. all mutual friends as well. Wow, such a small world. Yeah, so they're all... No wonder <laughs> they keep on talking about you as well. Now I know. Now I know. Yeah, I told them, hey, can you soft sell me uh, so that he will call me one day. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all my college mates. So like, you know, we're, for some reason, um, like we don't usually discuss politics on, on the show. Yeah. Because we've always had this impression that politicians are like, you know, of a different level than us. We're like the... Different level. We're, the, we're nobodies. We don't connect with the politicians. They do whatever they need to do mm. in order for the better of the country, quote unquote. And, you know, politicians are untouchable. But when you came along, it was a little bit different because I feel like a lot of my friends were like, hey, yeah, 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 he's quite approachable. You mm. know, I can talk to him. You know, mm. he, he's quite a friendly guy. He's not like those people that with with an air out there. Although he's famous, the numbers, okay, the numbers on your socials probably scare everybody more than yourself. Ayo, <laughs> then they, I should really recommend them to see me. And if anything, I just want to point out, uh, politics can never be separated from the people and people from politicians. Uh, if anything, uh, like how employees work for you in a company, mm -hmm. uh, I work for the employers and my employers are obviously my voters. Uh -huh. And that's inseparable. Anyone who tells you otherwise must really think that Malaysian politics is stuck in the 1950s. Yeah, oh, it, it is. I mean, like we, we've, we've always thought, like it, around the world, people always tend to think that, oh, our politicians must live their amazing life. You know what I mean? Oh my God. Then I should really get them to politics and let them experience one week. <laughs> <laughs> the life of a politician and they'll understand uh, and, and what it's like. So so you you are okay, how old are you this year? I'm thirty this year. Thirty this year. So yep. young, my goodness. Hey, like just, like, hey, our difference is not that big, okay. It differs quite big, but I don't dare say it because you know people will start judging me and asking, Hey, what's your secret? <laughs> but uh okay, you, you you've been doing this for how many years now? Politics in about six years. Six years. Yeah. So you started like when you're twenty four years old. Yeah, correct. When I was it, in actuality mm, about twenty three. 23, 23. Yeah. because I was working with, with uh, a few politicians before as a researcher, speech writer, but myself personally getting to politics, that's when I was about 23, 24. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was 23, I was lining up outside the concert, you know, asking for free tickets and, you know, when the weekend, say, hey, where you want to go? And then after this, oh, sorry, <laughs> la, I cannot, la, you know, I cannot make it, you know, stuff like that, you know, cause it's very expensive. How, used, how, do, how I, does I, I one... I do that as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how does one at the age... Or, or, okay, let's just rewind back to yeah. at what age did you tell yourself, okay, I want to be a politician or was that something that kind of like naturally fell in place mm, for you? I mean, definitely not. It's not something natural. I don't come from a political family. My mom uh, has been a civil servant throughout her life, a yeah. teacher. Uh, my father is a labourer commuting from Joe to Singapore every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have no one in my family who's in politics. So I was the first. And to be honest, at first I despised uh, politics. I've always wanted to be in public policy. Yep but not in the front lines because I value my privacy. <laughs> <laughs> I value my, my, my flexible work arrangements uh, and in politics, it's the exact opposite. Right. Um, however, what changed uh, was, um, I think sometime in 2015, I remember then I was already working as a researcher in the Prime Minister's office. I was working as an officer. I was working uh, as a part-time lecturer, as a debate trainer. So mm -hmm. I had multiple different jobs and I thought it was quite comfortable. 
Um, but I was confronted with a huge um, uh, corruption scandal. I think we all know, 1MDB. Yep. And being part of government then, I realised that I had to speak up. I cannot just uh, remain silent. But when I, decide, when, when I decided to speak up, to be honest, it was in no way uh, imagining myself getting into politics. It's just me sharing my views. But yep. when I shared my views, it was just on social media. It's not like I did a press statement, did a PC. No, it was a Facebook post. Okay. Just demanding for key reforms. But after that, immediately I lost almost all my jobs as a researcher, part-time lecturer. My students who I were training to represent Malaysia uh, uh, to the US were banned from representing Malaysia just because I was their trainer. Mm -hmm. And I thought that if that could happen to me as someone who wanted to share his opinion uh, on the way forward for Malaysia, imagine what others would face. Yeah. Uh, so that to me was my turning point. If it could happen to me, it could happen to anyone else. And if anything, what's the purpose of me being so passionate about public policy research? I can do thousands of theses and research papers, but in the end, if politicians in power are unwilling uh, to change or to accept that change, Malaysia will not get anywhere. And I love my country. I want to ensure that my country becomes a developed country mm. uh, one way or another. It's funny that you mentioned that, like, you know, when you mentioned uh, your, your, your views on social media and all of a sudden, you know, it just came raining down on your parade and then you lost this and you lost that. This is exactly the same... Um, mm. as what a lot of people would have felt, even myself. It's like, mm. okay, I shouldn't say this because I'll get into trouble. Mm. And like most of the time when you see those who speak out, yep. uh, whether it be it social media or publicly before there were social media, mm. a lot of our parents would be like, uh, see lah, you'll get into trouble soon. Uh, see lah, see lah, yeah, do lah, do lah. You know, I've see heard what that many times. Exactly. <laughs> so like, I feel, uh, okay, do you, so... If you look at that and then you compare it yourself today, has that changed or not? Are more people speaking out enough? I think it has changed, but not enough. Okay. Um, so today you can see uh, a lot more vocal critics on social media, whether to government, opposition, corporate entities, uh, in a way like never before. However, there are still many attempts to silence uh, free speech. You see people like Ami Hadi who spoke up against the LCS scandal now being dragged to court and has been charged. Mm -hmm. You see people like Fami Reza. I think the number of charges he, he has on him is uh, maybe a new record. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there are many people being charged uh, many times. So I think that has to change. If anything, uh, especially when you are in a position of power, you must be most susceptible to criticism. Because if not you will never be able to know whether you're doing uh, wh whether what you are doing is right or wrong. Mm. And the center of power, unless confronted with challenges, uh, will lead to great abuse. Right. Um, so the, the higher, uh, the, the, the more power you have, the more open you should be to criticism. Right. Well, we just, we just went straight right in into it. But like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have like friends who, your friends, you know, when you started becoming a politician, mm. and then obviously be like, well, Tewa, you know, YB and stuff like that. Do you get anyone coming up to you and say, say, what's wrong with our country? Mm, too and many what, times. Too ma and what, when, what is your response to them? I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'll always tell them, never give up on Malaysia. Yes, we're going through some bumps here and there, but ultimately we will become a full-fledged developed country which is governed well with integrity, dignity. Uh, but we must all partake in that journey mm -hmm. to change Malaysia uh, because politics, I mean, we can ignore politics, but politics will never ever ignore us and will follow us wherever we go. And the country which we will inherit is a country in which um, come from our parents and grandparents. And if we don't act today in policy, in criticism, then the Malaysia which we will inherit in the future may be completely different than what we want. Mm -hmm. I always try to convince them that there is hope, no matter how painful the process is. I remember even during the toughest of times for me, right, when we dragged to court, when I had to face, uh, when I lost all my positions, expelled from the party, mm -hmm. um, but when people ask me the same question, I say, no, this is a country worth investing and fighting in. Wow. It's, it's, but doesn't it get like, you know, really, how do you sleep at night actually? Like without that stress and burden that's basically raining down on you on mm. like 24, I would say 27 hours a day. La. Be because I'm finally doing something which I believe in. Mm -hmm. And that's why I can sleep peacefully at night. To be honest, if you asked me two years ago in 2020, mm -hmm. if I were to pick the different path to keep my ministerial portfolio uh, become the youth chief of the same party, uh, keep all the luxuries of life, whether I could sleep, then I'd say I couldn't. Because mm -hmm. my conscience is not clear uh, and I know I've uh, strayed away uh, from the path which I picked when I joined politics. Uh, but now, I can sleep so peacefully. Mm -hmm. With Muda, it's truly a multiracial, moderate entity. I know I'm with colleagues and friends who believe in the cause uh, like I do. And even if I face many, many defeats in the future, and that's common, and I think politicians must accept at one point in time they will be voted out. 
But finally, I'm at a path where I feel at home. Uh, home with people who believe in the same cause. Um, and a home which I feel very passionate in fighting on. So I can sleep peacefully at night. Right. But two years ago, if I had picked a different path, I'm fairly certain I would not be able to sleep peacefully <laughs> at night. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, congratulations on forming Muda. I mean, after, uh, I mean uh, after all the hurdles... <laughs> Right. Course, Obviously, yeah. like you know, forming a new party like this, you'll get a lot of skepticism. Yeah. Right. People be like, okay, what's what's next? Is it gonna be you know, mm. is is it gonna start with something that appeases the ma- the mass public? Okay, oh, I, I want to I won't even say the mass. Like yeah. you know, the the public who are very aware of yeah. what's going on. And after that, suddenly just fall back to the usual tactics. Yeah. Muda. They consist of mainly young people. I would say. A majority are those below 40, but our oldest member is 92 years old. So, <laughs> it's a very interesting mix. Uh, oh, really? I was just yeah. about to ask, you know, okay, what is considered Buddha? Because, you know, I want to see whether I fall into that category. You know? 100% you fall. Like, it's open to all. It's okay. meant to celebrate diversity. And diversity is not just about race and religion. It's also about age. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reason why we even uh, uh, call the party Muda is the acronym Malaysian United Democratic Alliance. Right. Um, and Muda is not, I mean, even the definition, literal definition of Muda, it's not only about age. It's about the way how you carry yourself, uh, the way how you think, the approaches which you carry. So it's a lot more disruptive. Mm-hmm. And disruption is not just about age, it's really about uh, the train of thought which we put in. Right. So, okay. With Muda in mind, okay, I, I, there are a lot of news. Okay, I, want, I, I read this just like yesterday. And sure. for me, it's like, okay, I already want to talk about this. You mentioned yep. that racial politics has actually failed in Malaysia. Definitely. All right, and uh, it brings me to these questions that I want to ask. But you know, I just, I just, I need to basically ask this Feel correctly. Free. Okay, Feel free. Yeah. so I, there was this uh, video that was going around on TikTok, and uh, it was uh, actually Yamcha sessions. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah, having a chat okay. with Tun M, and I think they asked him about um, asked Tun M to justify Bumi Putrajaya to a non-Muslim, mm. and his explanation was based on closing the gap between the rich and poor to maintain stability in the country. And what's your take on this? I would make three quick points. Mm-hmm. First thing first, if I mean, the source of uh, the policies behind the booming policy is the NEP, National Economic uh, Policy, which was introduced in 1969, 1970s. If it had truly worked, then please tell me with a straight face how a quarter of Bumi Putra in Sabah are still living below poverty line after mm-hmm. decades of the same policy. Tell me how the disparity among the rich and poor, among all races, so not just among Chinese, Malay, Indians, no, even within the Malays, for example, uh, have increased. Um, tell me... Uh, how, when I go back to my kawasan in Moa, uh, to Parit Jawa or Sri Penanti, I still see many uh, poor, underprivileged uh, Chinese parents uh, who are working two or three different jobs to just ensure that their kid can live a normal life. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, it clearly shows that we need to move away from the same race-based policies to one which is driven by data and policies. Yeah. Um, and the way in which we move forward Uh, to that, it must be driven by policy. Policy changes, policy reforms. Mm -hmm. And what frustrates me is that when we keep on, you know, moving back to the same, oh, I need boomy policy, boomy policy, boomy policy. But yet, even with data presented to us that there are a lot of gaps, lapses, which need to be improved. But at the same time, the people who are promoting this, especially if you look those in government today, are the ones who weaponize Bumi Putra policy to award multi-billion dollar contracts to their cronies who are Malays who will then end up subcontracting to people of other races. I mean, and to them, that's uh, one Malaysia for them, right? I mm-hmm. mean, really, a Malay guy gets a multi-billion dollar contract and subcontracts it to a Chinese and then, hey, hey see, we, are, we can work with one another, we are truly one Malaysia. It's not. I mean, tell me how uh, promoting a policy of direct nego via multi-billion dollar contracts to a few rich Malay businessmen could miraculously lead to millions of other underprivileged Malays suddenly getting better. Mm-hmm. So to me, that makes absolutely no sense. You want to help the underprivileged Malays? Help them. But do not forget that they are also underprivileged Chinese and Indians. Whenever we talk about it, I want to share one very interesting fact. We always fight Malay Chinese, Malay Chinese. People forget that the Indians are worse off. Mm -hmm. If you look at the report by Kazana Research Institute and many other uh, research uh, on the Indian community, intergenerational poverty among the Indians are the worst. The ability of an Indian kid who is brought up uh, in a family where the parents do not have tertiary education and to climb up the socioeconomic ladder, that Indian kid is three times behind the same context of a family for a Malay parent or a Chinese parent. So the intergenerational poverty of Indians are far, far worse. Yep. And yet we don't talk about this because it's convenient to make Malays and Chinese fight with one another. So what do I advocate for? What I advocate for is a gradual transition to a merit-slash-need-based policy in which we are cognizant of the socioeconomic factors in Malaysia. 
and whatever policy we make must be driven by data. If we know, for example, mm. that um, there is a need to help the Indian community specifically by tailoring policies, but to those who are genuinely underprivileged, then do it. If we know that there is a need to help, for example, the orang asli community specifically, and again, there's data which showed that they are specifically harmed and disadvantaged, do it. But it must be driven by data, not just by sentiment and emotions alone. The fear which I have is that by having a blanket policy which is driven by race and religion, mm -hmm. you're actually allowing uh, the richest of Malaysians, whether in politics or corporates, to weaponize it to safeguard their interests while pilfering from the poorest of poor. And I think that makes my country worse. It's funny that you mentioned uh, weaponizing, uh, using religion, um, because like I was just at like a, a, a gathering and a lot of people were just very just casually saying, ah, oh, you know, they're using religion to weaponize and they're using it as like a way to scare people and stuff like that. Mm. I, I, it's, it's funny that you mentioned all this because in my mind, it's like, you know, why must you generalize a, a, a specific race to be poor. I think mm. everybody goes through hardship. Everybody Correct. are equals. You know what I mean? Everybody goes through good good times and bad times. So why can't you help those who really need it? So mm. I'm glad you explained that. I mean, yeah. like, yeah, that's good. I mean, you, you don't have to go far. You just come down to more and you, I'm pretty sure you know many friends who face the same. And can you imagine how they would feel if I tell them in their face that you are considered to be subpar and suboptimal to me just because you are born in a different race and religion? Mm hmm and this is a country which we both love so, I mean, dearfully. So I think there must be um, a, a genuine change. And I mean, some of the older leaders may think otherwise because they came from a different generation. Yep. And I try my best to understand where they come from. I mean, in the 1970s, uh, it was a fairly different situation. Yep. But we are talking about Malaysia today. This is 2022. And I think it's time for us to move on. So, okay, would it, for, with you advocating change in this, wouldn't you be afraid that, you know, the, the, the Malay people would say that you're taking away their, their, their fundamental rights mm. as a Malaysian? What, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think they should also think that there are fundamental rights of other Malaysians as well who don't share the same skin colour or religion. Mm -hmm. In the end, this is our country together. We are born in this country together and hopefully we will die in this country together. Mm -hmm. um, and if anything, what I want is equal opportunities, not equal outcomes. So the point in which you provide equal opportunity, you may be an underprivileged Malay who generally need help, but there is also another uh, privileged Chinese with a rich background who are both vying for a scholarship. I'll say the underprivileged Malay should be given mm -hmm. the right to that scholarship. But if you reverse that situation as an underprivileged Chinese and a rich Malay, 100% pick the underprivileged Chinese. The point I'm trying to make is it's not about the race, but it's about equal opportunities, which will then equalize the playing field and I judge you based on your character, your value, your principles and your worth instead of the skin or religion which you are born into. So I think we need to try and move away from that kind of politics to one in which everyone is given an equal chance. Do you think Malaysians will rally behind this decision? You know, how long would it take for people to actually kind of like, okay, agree to this mindset? Because you can't expect everything to just happen overnight. Correct. Right? And that's why Muda is an investment. I did not create Muda up alone. It is with a team of people who believe that we need to invest in our future together. And even if we lose five elections from now, it is okay. We just keep on moving forward, make sure that we go on the ground, make people understand that the Malaysian narrative is the best narrative for us as a country to become a developed country. Um, and the slice and dice and the divisions in politics would actually make things worse. Uh, so yes, obviously there'll be a lot of resistance mm -hmm. when we talk about it, especially uh, with more disruptive policies, which we've said many times in parliament and outside of parliament. However, it is our duty to educate. We should not look down uh, upon those who disagree with us, who may come from a different generation. If anything, it is our responsibility to convince him or her that the way forward is one where we treat all Malaysians equally. Yeah, okay. The next question I want to ask you is like, you know, you've had a lot of mentors in the political, uh, political like, you know, uh, I would say group, mm -hmm. or should I say community, yeah. right? And, you know, all of the, some of them uh, you look up to have like very opposing uh, views as compared to what you view. And then, you know, they openly criticize you. But then again, you know, you openly say that, oh, they were my mentors. Yep. I think like Tan Sri Muhyiddin yep. was one of them. Um, you know, and then people call you like, oh, you, this, uh, this is Vela, is a hypocrite lah. Why mm. one minute he you know, wants to support a guy, this and that, you yep. know. Uh, when all these comments come to you, you know, how do you back that? One thing which I learned in politics, never ever take criticisms, disagreements, differences personally till the point that you're willing to burn bridges. Uh. And if you look at where we're at today, politics is so, bi I mean, it's so divisive to a point that even 
when you want to meet up with your opponent, uh, all hell will break loose. <laughs> and that kills bipartisanship. In the US, bipartisanship is there. In developed countries, bipartisanship is there. I can disagree with you on policy so heatedly that we can sit at the same table and find our commonalities to work our differences out. And that's how you become a developed country. I remember uh, when I was pursuing for Undi 18, the amendment of the constitution, everyone said that it's impossible to do it because Malaysia does not have a track record by partisanship and your government does not have a two-thirds majority. And mm. in Malaysia's history, when the government doesn't have two-thirds majority, no one has ever had a constitutional amendment passed through. But I said that's because you think in the way of the past. Mm -hmm. I'm going to meet up with every single president of every single party, including those in opposition. And instead of me sitting on my moral high horse or I'm a minister, they must come to see me, I'll fly to see them. I'll go to their house. If I have to host them for dinner and I have to cook, I will cook for them. The point is I'm very focused. I want to get the outcome. And I remember then when I met up with Datuk Sri Najib, people created, the, <laughs> oh my God, how could minister meet up with this person? Bandu, I don't know, Praswa. I was very focused. I wanted to talk about getting his support for Undi 18. Mm -hmm. I met up with Datuk Sri Zahid to get Amno support for Undi 18. I met up with Tok Guru Hadi. I met up with all the Menteri Besar. I flew to Sarawak, Sarawak to meet up with the Chief Minister. And to be fair to all of them, the discussion was very cordial and good and constructive because it was on policy. right? And in the end, when I got it through, I think people then started to realise that bipartisanship can work and we can win together while having our critical differences. So to answer your question, just now about mentors and Tanshri Muddin Yassin. It's the same thing. If there's anyone who should be really pissed off with Tanshri Muddin, I think it's me. <laughs> Let's not forget that today I'm facing charges in court because of a SOP party dispute in which he was the president, mm -hmm. right? And it was under his administration where I was charged. And what more, when he's also the president of the party because it involves party funds. Mm -hmm. But... If I were to be, I mean, the politician of the past and like, I'm not going to talk to you, you are useless just because... If you make things so personal, it's very hard to find common ground in common areas where you can work, but it must be for the interest of Malaysia. However, do you see me changing my vote? Do you see me jumping ship? I mean, if anything, I've proven myself when immense pressure was brought down against me and my family for one year and a half before I was charged because the threat was made one year and a half before. I did not shift, I did not move. When I was offered to become a minister, I rejected. When I was offered to become chairman of GLCs, I rejected. When the threats came, I rejected. It just shows that I can disagree with you heatedly, but it doesn't mean that I will hate you forever. Right. If anything, it's about making sure that we don't, don't lose sight uh, on our country. Right. So, okay, what is Buddha's plan for the next general election? Oh, that will be a... Old thesis and very long question. Uh, <laughs> but in summary, to be honest, uh, I, I want Muda to focus a lot more on the changes and the policies which we can bring. That's why I'm pretty sure you've seen or heard many attacks or about the seats, where we go to contest. The public is not interested in that. The public is interested to hear what are your policy plans? How will you move Malaysia in the right direction? And I've been asking Muda to talk about that a lot more. And that's why in Parliament, I've consistently talked about that. When I talk about political reforms, my dream is to create a Malaysia in which even one day where we have the worst prime minister in history of Malaysia, mm -hmm. our institutions are strong enough to ensure that our country will progress forward because it is the institutions which surpass the leader, not the other way around. Um, but that's when it comes to democracy and reforms. On education, I want to ensure that we provide equal opportunities instead of equal outcomes to all. I want it to be a fusion between a merit-based and a need-based system. I want to ensure that we create a world-class education system in which our subjects are relevant. You don't force a student to graduate and need, needing at least six years if you, uh, in comparison to other countries where it takes three to four years because you have to take in, in Malaysia, we have Asasi, Diploma, Metroclassy. I mean, we have four or five different routes, mm -hmm. which takes a long time. I want to trim the fat, cut it, make it shorter to ensure that people graduate faster so they have better and, and more work experience, chances for internships, pursue their passion. So there are so many things I want to do when it comes to education, uh, when it comes to the economy, I want to create an economic system in which we can redistribute wealth equitably. So one where there is just and fair capitalism, not unfettered capitalism. Yes, that means more progressive taxation, mm -hmm. but more progressive taxation in a system which is built with integrity, where every single cent will be redirected to those who come from underprivileged family backgrounds so that then we can unlock their true potential. And when that person becomes better, the whole of Malaysia becomes better as well. Climate change, I feel very passionate about. I want to ensure that Malaysia uh, invests a lot 
in the green economy and transition from a carbon intensive economy to a green economy. I want to ensure that we deal with floods a lot better, not just pay money when floods actually hit. Mm-hmm. I mean, 10 days last year, we lost 6.5 billion ringgit, but we could have stopped that if we had invested, I mean, 2.5 billion ringgit in terms of uh, flood mitigation before that. So there are a lot of things which I think I want Muda to focus on. But if you talk about strategy, our strategy is to just work for the people 24 hours a day, seven times a week throughout the year and focus on resolving their needs by focusing on solutions. Yeah, I, I want to narrow down on uh, education. Rewind back about, oh man, I'm going to give away my age you now, am I? <laughs> 20, about 20, 20, about 30 years ago when I was in school. So how has the education system... 20 to 30 years ago in school. Uh. <clears throat> 30 years. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay never mind. <clears throat> I mean, 20 years ago in school. Okay. Uh, 25 now. Yeah. Uh, just give and take 25 now, okay? <sighs> How ha- okay, that, that will bring me back to about 2001 to mm. 2007. I'm not going to say anything. But <laughs> how has the education system changed? Actually, let me rephrase my question. How has the Malaysian education system improved since then until today? I'm very worried. To be honest, I'm very worried because there are many parents who I meet up with who are telling me that while they were beneficiaries of the public education system, they went to Sekolah Kebangsaan, Sekolah Benengah. But today, and they, these are not rich parents, they're middle class. If given a chance, they will send their children to either private or international school, willing to spend 25% of their monthly disposable income to send their children to school. And I don't judge them. Mm-hmm. That just means that we have failed to reform our education system to keep it... Uh, with global standards. And yep. now there are more choices and they will pick those choices. With that in mind, just to point out how sad of a state we are in now. <laughs> and I can say that because I was an educator before. I come from a family of teachers as well. And I think we have some of the smartest and brightest of teachers. So do not blame them. I blame policymakers. And that's where I want to be one to change it. Malaysia outspends both Japan and Singapore on education spending per capita. That means for every Singaporean kid to a Malaysian kid, we outspend a Singaporean kid. The Malaysian government spends. On average, we spend about 16 to 17% of our GDP on education. Singapore mm-hmm. is about 11 to 12%. Japan is about 7%. We spend, outspend them so much. Not just that. Despite the government putting in 50 to 60 billion ringgit on education funding every year, parents put in an additional 30 billion ringgit because they don't trust <laughs> in the 50 to 60 billion ringgit. Right? And to me, that just shows a great failure. It doesn't end there. You're looking at public education now becoming the second or third choice. And that's where you now people complain, oh my God, look at schools, they're becoming more mono-ethnic. Oh, we need to abolish vernacular schools. Hey, vernacular schools today are becoming more multiracial. I mean, you look to vernacular schools today, it's not uncommon to find 20 to 30% of non-Chinese in those schools. Yeah. I mean, if you go to private international schools, they're becoming Sekolah Kebangsaan in the 1980s. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, it's- and this is the part where I get most frustrated about. We know that there are systemic problems, mm. but those in power are still unwilling to change it, to make schools truly multiracial, to make schools driven by policy and data, making sure that the subjects which we teach are relevant, making sure that we create world-class students who will end up getting the best of jobs. But when you ask the politicians to change, you know, you you know? and then the Malays will be very angry because you talk about this very sensitive subject, you talk about this. The point is not doing anything will lead to a path of destruction. Mm-hmm. But I remember when I was part of cabinet then, when I was saying we need to bring all these changes. I remember when there was, when there was a pushback. And it was, it, the, this is the biggest irony, and I think it's the biggest hypocrisy as well, which lasts until today when I meet up with MPs in parliament, when I talk about it, they say, Sadiq, you're not Malay enough. Right? Mm. The biggest irony in hypocrisy, the same people who say that you're not Malay enough, the same people who say we should not change our education system and keep and maintain the status quo, and the one who are sending yeah, kids overseas. Yeah, <laughs> children in Tadika in France <laughs> and then go to Eton College. Right? They go to the best of colleges and universities where they have to spend hundreds of thousands of ringgit every year. But they leave the underprivileged Malay Chinese Indian in the worst of schools. I mean, really, if that that is not pure hypocrisy, I do not know what is. So I think it's not just about making cosmetic changes, we need to reset our education system. The fact is today. Not only do we outspend developed countries when it comes to education, but at the same time, while we outspend them so much, a Malaysian student is three years behind in terms of education to a Singaporean student. So a 15-year-old Malaysian is equivalent to a 12-year-old Singaporean. And not just that, a 15-year-old Malaysian 
will need to take two or three additional years before he or she can get the degree. So five years behind. Yeah. And in the world today, you would know after COVID, uh, you just said you do a lot of work for home now. The Malaysian graduates, not competing with Malaysians only, we're competing with graduates from IIT Bombay, NUS, NTU, UP Daliman, from University of Indonesia. And they have, what, five years ahead of us and we are so far behind. Mm -hmm. And I get very worried about this because the best way to look and track the success of a country is to look at the education system. Yeah. And I think it's time for us to change it for good. Yeah, it's, I, <laughs> I believe education is every child's fundamental right. Yep. It should not be a premium. Mm. I, I, I always believe that. Why do I... I, I, every parent, I'm a parent, la, so you know. Yeah. Obviously, I had this conversation. My wife, I would love to, ha you know, make sure that she teaches, uh, go to a school that teaches her to not memorize. Because you know, mm. we're kids, right? We all thought to memorize at one times one, yep. two times two, five times five is four. Oh, sorry, you know, I still suck at that today. Mm. But like, you know, I, I, I want when, when, and, and all of a sudden, okay, this is just my, my kind, my kind of experience. When I was in uh, high school. Not a very bright student, by the way. Okay, so we followed the Malaysian syllabus. I'm not blaming the syllabus. I was yep. just a very slow learner, mm. and everything was just about memorizing and whatever not. But the minute I went to university and their system, the way yep. they teach was so different. I failed accounts from like form three to form five. I hated oh. that subject. My I found my an accounting stream. I understand. Yeah, my uh, my accounting teacher <laughs> called me like, uh, I was like, oh, can I like we're just before SPM? I said, oh, can I have like you know extra class? You know, like, like yep. you know, like she's like, never mind, I like, just give up. <laughs> She, I mean, jokingly, oh but she's like, uh, you know what? Okay, uh, maybe we do spot questions. Lah. If this come out, then you're lucky. If not, then sorry. Bye-bye. I brought back a high distinction transcript to her when I was in university. She couldn't oh, wow. believe her eyes. And I was like questioning myself, why did I do better in university than I did in uh, in high school? Yep. And then my mom was like telling, because my mom's actually a civil servant as well. She's oh, wow. a teacher. So she oh, told me, oh, amazing. yeah. So she said, oh, maybe you failed and yeah, you scared lah, you know, cause you know, money is not easy to come by. You scared to waste my money. And then I'm mm. like, no, not really though. I was, uh, the application, there's explanation and there's application. Yep. So I got the explanation. I didn't understand. But when I did the application, I completely understand. Yep. So I felt that we did not get that in school. Everything yep. was just written on a blackboard and mm. then, you know, Digested. listen, listen, listen. But, you mm. know, I'm not blaming my teacher. And mm. I'm maybe, you know, maybe I was not fast enough, mm. but I feel, yeah. You can do better. Yeah, education. And and to be honest, I have not been in school uh, because if I'm still in school, then what am I doing, right? Because, mm. But I feel like back then until today, I feel like nothing much has changed. I'm, I'm wondering why. When during the pandemic, you mm. have most of the students sitting at home Correct. without a laptop, without an internet connection, mm. Um, missing their PMR, their, yep. uh, well, what they call it, do they call it PMR PT3. still? PT3, PT3. They call yep. it, missing their SPMs, you know, mm. delaying it. Yep. While I have cousins and friends in Singapore telling me that, oh, no, no they're just doing their online studies every day. Correct. Yep. And I'm like, oh, is it? And their child is like, not like yep. college kids or like 15 year olds, 16 year olds, you know, who yep. knows? These are kids who do not know how to use a laptop. They're four year olds, five year olds, even preschool. Uh, they, they even have like if they were to do any like even kids like preschool kids yep. if they want to do any like you know uh, art class or whatever not, they will send all the things to the home and then they'll do it all online and I'm like oh how come we don't do that yeah I mean you, you, you said it really well I pointed out just now that a Malaysian student on average is five years behind the Singaporean student studies have showed in terms of primary secondary education they're three years behind when they enter university it takes two additional years for, year, for us to get our degree in comparison to a Singaporean grad so that's five years. Can you imagine now, during times of COVID, right? Not to say it, the disparity is already huge. They are attending classes online. They have all the gadgets, gadgets and equipments. In Malaysia, formal study done, only one out of two students in Sabah, Sarawak have access to a gadget. Mm -hmm. And even if they do have access, internet is remarkably slow or non-existent. In Semenanjung, one out of three. Can you imagine those who now not only couldn't attend schools, who are already behind their peers, regional peers, yep. and now have not attended school for the last two years because they don't even have a gadget. And until today, the government has said, we're going to spend 450 million for gadgets. And they just started rolling it out hmm. a few weeks ago. It's been two goddamn years. I mean, we don't panic about it. We will always be playing catch up. And that's why I think we need to really focus on the level up agenda. We need to level up our education system. We need to focus on policies. We need to target assistance. We really need to catch up to the greatest of extent before we get left too far behind. Yeah, and, and you, okay, you mentioned Singapore. So I, I got a segue into Singapore. Like, you know, we keep saying that our food's better than Singapore. <laughs> 
I mean, we cannot we cannot go on forever using that as a reason why Malaysians are better, right? Correct. I mean, like, I I just like, you see, like for the layman or out there, right? They always you, on Twitter. It's easy to argue. Oh, Singaporean uh currency is higher than Malaysia. It's going to three point three. That they get angry. Oh, you know how come is it like that? Like that? And mm. that's it. The, the 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 argument just stops there. They just vent out their frustration and yeah. Nothing else is being explained, or you know, nobody goes into detail on why mm. is it like that. What do you think? What do you think went wrong? What what, what did Singapore do? Okay, let me rephrase that question. You know, what, what why why is their standard of living far more superior than ours? What do you think went wrong? What happened? You know, is it because they're a smaller island, hence easier to manage? That's why. Oh, no problem. I mean, we've seen smaller islands fail as well, mm. um, especially at the stage of inception. So we have to give credit to Singapore where it's due. They've done an exceptional job in turning a swamland into one of the most successful cosmopolitan states in the world. Mm -hmm. And now seen to be the the reference point in Southeast Asia. And I get very envious about that. Uh, not in a negative way, more of a way where I want Malaysia to do better. Um, but what we can learn from it, it's not only about one or two leaders. You see, Lee Kuan Yew, the late Lee Kuan Yew has left us. Now it's Yan Long and now they're already preparing the transition to Minister Lawrence. Yeah. So it's not just about the leader, it's not just about the party. One thing which Singapore has done very well is to build strong systems and institutions. Mm. Because it will be systems and institutions which will outlast any leader and any party. And that's why I move back to what I said at the start. I envision for Malaysia in which we build such strong democratic practices, institutions, systems, checks and balances, where even if one day Malaysians miraculously pick the worst version of Malaysian you can get, the most racist, close-minded, non-policy-centered person, but our country will still be on the right footing because our institutions will be strong enough to weather the storm. I think we need to start investing a lot more in building strong institutions and practices and systems instead of finding a miraculous leader to suddenly make Malaysia the greatest place. Mm -hmm. Because that leader can be really good, but if the system is corrupted, it's divisive, it's racialized, that leader will have to play the same game. So in the end, I think it's about resetting the whole system. And that's one area where we can learn from Singapore very well. Look at how they build such a great public service. Uh, I've worked with Malaysian Public Service and I've had the greatest of experience working with them. I think in the end, if you just reset at the top in terms of policies, giving them more flexibility, making sure appointments are done in a better way, trust me, they will immediately transform to become one of the best. It's not that they are not great. It's just that when the system doesn't change, oh yo, then uh, it becomes a, 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 a very big problem. Right. Now, um, do you ever aspire to be prime minister of the country? Mm, one thing which I learned, I can tell you very upfront, every, almost everyone who I know who aspires to become the prime minister will not become. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, let's be very frank. Do you think Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri at one point in time would have thought in the last one year, two years, heck, 10, 20 years that he would become the prime minister? No, I probably yeah. prob he probably didn't Maybe roadmap it, you know. Correct. But you know, it happened. <laughs> so I mean, congratulations to him. <laughs> so, so one thing, one thing which which I also learned as well. Once you um, only focus on that position, yep. you lose your principles, you lose your values, you lose your focus on how you want to bring change. Because mm -hmm. the reality is, even if you don't become prime minister, but you have a prime minister who believes in the same ideals and values, and you are you are in a team of leaders who believes in the same ideals and values, you can still change Malaysia. So. I think there are many other ways to skin the cat to reach the destination. Okay. Now, um, here are some other questions that I got my team to actually come up with and I found it really interesting. So I need to ask these. Sure. Okay, let's start with this one. Okay, what do you think about Fami Reza's drawing of you kissing uh, PH butt in satire in general? I think it's hilarious. <laughs> to be honest, I just I don't want to share my exact... So I saw it I saw it exactly as that. Yeah. A few of my other friends actually didn't know that was a butt. Oh. I'm oh. like, guys, how slow can you be, man? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I actually have the greatest of respect to to Fami Reza. Uh, have, you, have you met? Have you spoken to him in person? Or I've him in spoken person? to him. I think in like one or two events, but not for long. Yeah. Um, but I know he's someone who I definitely want to feature prominently in Malaysian politics. Whether criticizes or support, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The point is, you need someone like that to get the message out yeah. fast and quick. I may have my disagreements in the message or the purpose, but that's my job to explain, and it is his job to paint the other side of the story and that's what makes a mature democracy. So he's bringing it up and you have to explain yourself. Correct. Oh, okay. And, and okay, what is uh, Munda's decision to join PH? You know, what, what led to that decision? 
I can't believe that my, my young team is actually asking these questions. It just shows that the youth, right, the younger ones are, are getting more and more interested in politics. Don't you think so? They are. Because I mean, like, okay, re- back when I was in high school, I don't care about politics, mm. right? None of us actually. Uh, nobody talks about it. Mm. But you know, it's a, a funny thing I got to tell you about this. The first day that you guys went back to uh, parliament, right? Yep. We were all working from home. All of us were streaming it, you know, and watching it. <laughs> it must have been so bored. It's hilarious. <laughs> we were all watching it together, streaming it on our Zoom call, and all of us were like just commenting and laughing. Yeah. And I'm like, I would have never. When I was like 20 years old, I wouldn't even go to RTM one RTM. I just watched Parliament. Yep. It's it's so funny that we were doing that and. And it's 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 good. I'm I'm not sure whether it's it's right of me to say that. It's good that that our younger uh, generation are getting yep. a, little bit, a little bit more politically aware. Yeah. I don't need. We don't need them to be very well invested, but just yep. you not know, politically aware. But back to the question: the yep. decision to join Pakatan Harap and what led to that decision? See, when I fought against the Sheraton move, which then led me to be expelled and charged, um, I wanted to focus on building a coalition of values, principles, and ideals. I think in last election, many have already tried the safe and easy method, mm-hmm. which is I call the pandering tactic. You set up money party, pander, play the same politics, get some bank of votes, form a coalition, and hope that you'll win. I think those days are over. It's time for us to invest in the future, pick the tougher route, but keep on moving the needle one step ahead. So when Muda was set up, it was meant to be the most diverse, multiracial, moderate, policy and service-centered party in Malaysia. Mm-hmm in wanting to really reset and level up Malaysia. By acknowledging that we are a new party, I mean, we're not even a year old. (laughs) We just got a registration uh, end of December, early January this year. Mm -hmm. Entering election, especially in a democratic system, which is first past the post. Malaysia is not proportionate representation. If it was, it would be a very different route. First past the post means winner takes all. Um, And if you don't have a majority in that seat, you may control 20% of voters in Malaysia. One out of five will vote for you, but that one out of five voting for you will still mean you have zero seats. Mm -hmm. So it requires uh, coalition-based politics. Um, And what, I mean, I think the days where we pick a coalition coalition just based on convenience is over. It's time for us to pick a coalition which also shares some semblance of ideals, values, and principles like you. I value PH cooperation. Mm -hmm. It is multiracial, it's moderate. I have a lot of my colleagues, cabinet colleagues who I worked very well with, Gobin Singh, Yo Bi Yin, Hana Yo, right? um, Saifuddin Nasution, and many others who I worked very closely with and leaders who I have great respect with. Uh, and if anything, we've gone through hardship together. Yep. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not just the one who was offered um, bags of cash, contracts, positions uh, to jump. They were offered, they didn't take it. They, 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 they did not take it. Mm-hmm. And we are in this together in the long run. So yes, it will be difficult. Uh, and there may be differences in opinions, but it's my job to try my best to iron it out. If all else fail, then we'll part ways respectfully. However, I do not want to lose sight on the vision to change Malaysia and reset us for good. Right? And uh, it's better to enter as a team than to enter as an individual. Right. Okay. And the next question. <laughs> I love how you're looking at them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so these questions I'll be like oh wow uh, okay hey, uh, I, I watched this actually I shared this with my team you work with Namui oh Namui yeah it's yeah, uh, amazing he's from Moa by the way oh really yeah, yeah. oh okay he's my constituent in Moa oh and, and uh, how did that collaboration come about uh, group of common friends uh, got us together and then um, yeah it became a very interesting video which uh, proved to the world that I cannot dance and yeah I, I was Kaku about to question person. your yeah I was questioning your dancing though it's I was okay. like it just, it just proves that uh, <laughs> I, I'd rather stay in politics and not uh, <laughs> 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 hey, trust me there's a lot more that one is still okay if he had showed you at least like 10 seconds of me dancing uh-huh. I think I'll lose like a million votes <laughs> it was so bad uh, but in a way I think Nemui is another figure right uh, like Fami Reza disruptor yep. out of the box they will be people who really like him and people who really hate him. The point is, you may really hate him, but you don't have to jail him, lah, right? You can agree to disagree. And uh, working with him was very interesting. I think we got the message out, which is really to build a politics which is based on values and principles. Uh, and he's really a fun person to be with. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there were some people, I mean, like you posted a picture with him and then um, I think there were some people saying that Nemui has a history of opposing authority and there are similar comments, you know, like what, what, what do you have to say about those things? Like, uh, Why are you working with someone like that? I mean, th- I mean, that's the beauty of Malaysia, right? It's the diversity in, in opinions and approaches. I mean, 
there may be issues which even I disagree with him on. But that doesn't mean I should use the force of the authorities to clamp down on him. We just disagree, but we have a lot more commonalities. He's a guy who loves this country so much. Right? The way how he telegraphed that message may be very different, <laughs> controversial, but that in no way makes him less of a Malaysian. I mean, when he goes abroad, he promotes Malaysia to the eyes of the world. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so some will accept, some won't. But I think the best way to move forward allow him to express himself freely. And when there are disagreements, we fight on facts and figures instead of using the authorities and the laws to clamp down on him. I know that Namui loves Malaysia like dearly to his heart because yeah. everything he promotes is of his own country. Yeah. That's true. And, you know, and like uh, w- w- Malaysia Day, Namadeka Day, they'll, without fail, he'll come up with a song that, that yeah. sings in multiracial languages. Correct. Which is amazing because like for me, it's like... I've I've spoken to him before. Yeah. I mean, I met with him, and he, he asked me to be in, in some of his videos. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa! You go up to him, and he's just this one guy who is so down to earth. Yeah. And you'd be like, you just you know, you're like, oh, he's working with me. He, yeah. uh, you know, like watching, oh, this is this is a superstar at work. But all he's doing yeah. is telling us like, he's so simple. Ah, I want this. I want this. I want this. Why? Uh, as you sing in Malay, you sing in Chinese, and you sing in Tamil and yeah. stuff like that. And the way he works is just. It's amazing. just amazing, but never yeah. dance again. So I, think, I was please. just I was just worried after this he doesn't want to see me because of how bad of a dancer I am. Oh, it's okay, maybe <laughs> they got the view. <laughs> they got the views though. <laughs> it was the first <laughs> comment among all of us like, oh, he can't dance. Huh? It's okay, no problem, no problem. Oh my god, the number of times people have asked me to attend dance classes. There are also now people who send me DMs offering uh-huh. me free dancing classes. Can really? you imagine? That's I- how bad. I was. You should take up that offer and then you know <laughs> go for a, go for another one and and see if you improve. But <laughs> Ayo. <laughs> all right. Um. Now I think like in your recent uh interview together with the Ming thing. Yeah. Shout out to the Ming thing. Woo. Cool guys. <laughs> uh. I think you mentioned that like uh, Malaysians that leave the country for greener pastures are still considered Malaysians at heart. Would you like to kind of like re uh like mm. bring our listeners who are listening today up to speed? What 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 you meant about by that comment? I say that because uh, see it's very convenient for us to demonize those who left Malaysia mm-hmm. or they are less patriotic they don't care about Malaysia they want to leave immediately when they get the chance to do so leaving Malaysia if you think about it it's not an easy option mm-hmm. yes you may get a really good high paying job let's say in Singapore and the UK but before you leave you have to think am I ready to leave my family behind am I ready to leave the comfort of affordable food behind mm-hmm. am I willing to leave many things behind, my whole network which I built for the past 20 years behind and to go to a foreign land. It's not an easy choice. So when they made that choice, there must be a strong reason behind it. Yep. And I believe once they have left, my duty as a policymaker, and I speak from the position as a policymaker, is not to demonize them, but it's to build a better Malaysia so that naturally they'll be magnetized to come back. Right. Not out of me forcing him or her, but because he or she will see Malaysia as a great country to live in, to vote in, to die in, right? So it is my job as a policymaker to do so. And I believe instead of demonization, it's better to focus on building a stronger Malaysia. Do you you think a lot of Malaysians are, if they can and afford it, and if they can or if they they can afford it, leaving Malaysia? As of now, yes. And I'm a very data-driven guy. Recent study showed that 75% of young Malaysians have given a choice to leave Malaysia, they will leave. And uh, if you look at the ranking of reasons why they would leave, still the main will be economic reasons, yep. right? Uh, and, and economic reasons will be tied to discrimination, in, 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 in equities, etc. But it's still about wages because wages in Malaysia are unbelievably low in comparison to neighboring countries. And then um, that will be the main driver. So if anything, that's why I said we need to change how we approach our economy or education system before it is too late. Mm-hmm. Because the brain drain issue is not a new issue. It's been discussed for God knows how many decades already. I mean, there are, what, I think one or 2.5 million high-skilled Malaysians abroad. Can you imagine what we could do if they were all back? But we cannot expect them to come back if our industries are not even ready to bring them in. The last thing which I want is for, let's say, uh, uh, a well-known statistician uh, in, uh, in, in working in New York, uh, now suddenly coming back, and then instead of working in a really good job, becomes a grab rider. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. seriously. So I think I have a duty to change Malaysia to ensure that they will come back because I know deep down they are still very much Malaysian like me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, um, 
I mean, it's great that you you want to fight for all these changes, but I, do you think that Malaysians are getting really, really impatient when all politicians are trying to tell them that oh, don't worry, we will make Malaysia a mm. better, a better, a better place? Because you know, um, in the elections in uh, 2018, you mm. know, when Pakatan Harapan won that, you know, they yep. they, they basically rallied for change. Yep. And three, two, two years later, the <laughs> the <they ended> up <laughs> wow. one year and a half actually. One year so and a half. Short, yeah. Change did happen, but you know. <laughs> It did happen, but not the change that we all basically hope for. Yeah. Do you think Malaysians are going to still believe whatever politicians are going to tell them in this next election? And that's why there's a great calling for young, authentic politicians who focus on the message of change and policies and the vision which he or she would want to bring. Mm-hmm. It's no longer the same old politics where you can hammer the opponents until they fall without actually expecting to build anything up. And I think that has, that has made me... Uh, a lot more matured in politics and many of my colleagues in opposition a lot more matured. So my message is this, change always takes time. Yep. Um, but ultimately it is worth it. So let's, uh, you know there's a saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. So mm-hmm. let's look at the hypothetical. Let's say in 2018 change did not happen. Yep. We would not have gotten uh, many criminal cases and corruption cases exposed, charged in court and convicted. Yep. We wouldn't have been able to bring in, now I think we've already covered almost 6 billion ringgit of people's money abroad through 1MDB reparation, so we've gotten it back. Can you imagine what would have happened to the state of Malaysian politics after? I mean, I think I'm fairly sad I'll be behind bars already. Mm-hmm. Uh, many other my colleagues are behind bars. And I think the state of Malaysian politics would be far, far divisive. So yes, there were setbacks, right? Um... I think the change which was expected on us was not executed fast enough. Reform should have done faster, but the alternative would have been far, far worse. And let's look, even now, today, we've changed three governments, yep. right? But you realise while we've changed three governments, we've actually passed many policy reforms in parliament. Mm-hmm. For the very first time, enter Hopping Bill. We got the Undi 18 constitution through. We got, um, uh, now we are discussing about political funding act and two term limits for the prime minister. Bipartisanship, is, uh, has flourished. So I think while there are many setbacks, I think we've, mo- we've moved the needle forward. Um, is that enough? Of course not. That's why I'm very keen on resetting Malaysia uh, and levelling up Malaysia. But I think that takes a little bit of time. My only hope and dreams and wishes is that Malaysians will not give up I'm not saying do not give up on me or do not give up in a party or do not give up in politicians. Do not give up in our country because ultimately it will take time. Even those Malaysians who are abroad, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's okay for you to be abroad, work abroad. But when the time comes and you know when the time is right, that's where we need to strike. Right. Okay, this is now my my question. <laughs> there are a lot of questions here. They, they ask really some, some really good <laughs> questions, to be honest. I, I don't think I'll be able to ask that great questions. My team is amazing. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, right now, one USD is almost like 4.5. Yeah. 4.5, 4.5, 4.8, 4.8 and, stu- and, and stuff like that. Um, I think you posted something about it that it's it's going to be damaging to our economy and stuff. Right. But, you know, you, you and then you have some people opposing it and said that, um, you know, so I think you could do better because um, it's not... Don't don't politicize the 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 exchange rate value when US and Singapore are doing better in the world, but the MYR is actually doing much better than some other countries around our region. And this is a problem I have, which is in Malaysian politics as well. I think that sums it so well. Why are we benchmarking ourselves so low? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, these are all developed countries. Maybe you just benchmark among the lower regional peers. Hey, back then we were always aspiring to be the best in this region. Mm-hmm. Since when we were playing to get great B, C, D, E, F. I mean, just, just not F, right? Not <laughs> fail. No, we should aspire to be better and one of the best. And above and beyond that, I'm not saying it's out of fun. You know why inflation rates are still high in Malaysia? People still feel it, even though the official government figures show that inflation is low. Mm-hmm. It's because in Malaysia, every year we import 60 billion ringgit of food from abroad. And when we import, I think, very logical thing to say, when our currency is weak, cost of conversion is higher, that means when the food is brought in, we pay even more. All right? So it is a big issue. It affects our pockets every single day. So when people say, oh no, it only affects those who travel abroad, if you, uh, if you, if you want to go on a holiday, it's a lot more expensive. I mean, really, I don't think they understand how the weakening of the currency hurts us at home. Um, and above and beyond that, I think the weakening of the currency also indicates a greater problem. It's the lack of trust of investors in our economy. 
and in our country and the direction which our country is heading to. So that's why I think we need to change and change quick. And I'm not preaching this in terms of changing government or leaders per se. I mean, if this new government could just focus instead of thinking about elections every damn day, having wet dreams about it every damn day, so damn frustrated about it, just focus on governing until the end of the term, right? Investors will know there is some stability, there is time. Opposition will play their role, like myself, as, as a form of check, check and balance. And we can focus on building our country post-COVID recovery and then make this country a better place for all Malaysians. And then when we fight it, we fight it in elections. It's okay. But no, things are so fractious and unstable. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, so yes, it does affect the everyday Malaysian. Mm -hmm. And when I say it, it's not for the sake of saying it or for the sake of criticizing. We need to aspire for Malaysia to be the best in this region. Stop playing second fielder, second fiddle and like, oh, it's okay. We just benchmark ourselves with other countries, but not the best. I see. I like all these change that you 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 aspire to do. You know, it's gonna take a long time. Are you gonna okay? So like, it seems like you basically set your whole career in stone. You know, how long are you gonna see yourself as a politician? You know, is there one? Is there a tipping point where you're like, you know what? It's enough. I'll take a step back. Any politician who thinks that they are too big and that no one else can bring that change is a politician which has failed even before he or she begins. Mm -hmm. Because the dream of being a good politician is building a good team and a team which build great institutions in which will supersede that politician. Kuan Yu has left us for a while. Why are people in Singapore still talking about Kuan Yu? Why are people across the globe still thinking about Kuan Yu even though he has passed away? It's a Singapore which he has built today. The institutions which still stand, the good leaders which still exist in Singapore today. So in Malaysia, my dream is to not stay in politics for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and have that kind of point, right? Um, so to be honest, I think if you have a good team, you just need two electoral cycles to reset Malaysia. And after that second electoral cycle, so that's about 10 years. Yeah. And if you lose after, it's okay. Because you know that Malaysia will still be in safe hands. Because the opposition may be a dignified opposition mm -hmm. with a strong anti-corruption team, with proper democratic practices and institutions. The team which will beat you may be a better team than you. Let them govern, right? Uh, or if there's someone better in your party who replaces you, let him or her govern. So what? I mean, you should, you should not be too big to a point that you cannot be replaced. Malaysia should aspire to follow that line of politics instead of one which is so personality-driven till a point that institutions are tied to him or her. That makes us fail. Wow. wow. This is a very long conversation. <laughs> this is the most politics I've ever talked about in, uh, in Mama <laughs> sessions. And, and the only reason why I want to do this and I, well, obviously to talk with, I mean, like, I could have done this with YB Hannah Yo, but you know, <laughs> but at that time we were, we were talking, I didn't know how to kind of like walk my way into it. Uh, mm. but I think like discussing it with you is just, a, I f okay, for me, is I'm not going to lie. I'm not that I'm trying to... I hope mm. Fami Reza won't basically... Okay, he will never draw a picture <laughs> of me. Uh, I'm not kissing your butt. I'm not kissing your ass. You're just more approachable. I feel like you're, you you're, you make it more... Uh, you just give that vibe of like, okay, yes, bring whatever criticism you have. And for me, it's like, okay. And that's what I feel every media should be given mm. the freedom for. To exactly. really say what they want. I, I, I mean, like, I literally just said that, you know, you, 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 you were trying to politicize yep. the currency and stuff like that. So I, and, and you, okay, you know, I'm, I'm having It's you, a fair point. It's a, yeah, yeah, and, you know, you have your explanation, stuff like that. Mm. I feel media does not have that sort of freedom mm. to, 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 to basically report whatever they want. And what do you think about that landscape right now in Malaysia? I want for the media to have complete freedom. Um... Because in the end, if the media doesn't have complete freedom, it will always be the richest and most powerful Malaysians who will control Malaysia forever. And I'm very worried about that. Mm. So that means if I don't play their game, which is to meet up with the same corporates, same politicians, ex-politicians who control the whole system, I will never succeed. And when I want to bring a little bit of change, they'll call me up, you can't do this. They'll call me up, you can't do this. I do not want to play that game, mm -hmm. right? I mean... Previously, we tried this all internal way of change. doesn't work. Now it's time for us to disrupt for good. It will take a long time, of course. Uh, they, will <laughs> they will shut me down many times, but it's okay. I'm prepared to lose. I think politicians must be prepared to lose. If they're not prepared to lose, they're willing to do anything to stay in power. Um, so to just show a few key examples. I remember when I was uh, in the ministry, um, 
just a few months after I was uh, appointed, um, there were a few AMNO leaders, young AMNO Siswa, they were yeah, university leaders who spoke in the General Assembly, yep. condemned government, condemned me specifically, and then they were about to be news that they were about to be taken action because they were scholars. Mm-hmm. In cabinet, I raised it up immediately. I said, if you take action against them, I'll be the first one to disagree and to fight this. Oh, I remember that one. I remember yeah. even if he or she calls me the you know, most blatant of curse words, it's okay, right? <laughs> I mean, I'll deal with it. I won't call you a chiba as well. I will, instead, I'll just deal with your arguments, mm-hmm. right? That's better. Um, I remember when there were lecturers who also wrote some very malicious and defamatory uh, articles against government and specific leaders. I said the best way, if you disagree and you think that's defamation, take it to court. Don't use the police separately. That's not right. Don't expel the, the, the lecturers. Go through a proper process. There must be a board. There must be hearing. And mind you, today those lecturers are working. Some working for the prime minister. Some mm-hmm. working for ministers. They are officers. They are party members. Mm-hmm. Right? So what? They may be party members. We may have differences in political viewpoints. But that does not mean that they are bad and evil in every way. Mm-hmm. So I think the best way to approach it, and that's, mind you, that's to my political opponents, Media are not my opponents, right? Obviously, the media will want to sensationalize some news. Sure, then it's my job to respond. Mm-hmm. It's my job to then talk to the other competitor to say, hey, he or she has sensationalized. I hope you can report uh, my, my views on this. And that's how competition works. Right. Right? So, and the me- I don't think people understand how important the media is in Malaysia today. If the media is not there, it's not free, it's not independent, it's almost impossible to make Malaysia a developed country because corruption will be rife and you can hide it easily. Abuse of power will be everywhere. The richest will continue, to, the, the, the richest of Malaysians will continue to be the richest of Malaysians because they will control every single thing and information which happens in this country. Right. We need to change that. With all the, the, the points or all, all the changes that you want to fight for, like, you know, this may be a very, this may be a very tough question to, to, to decide whether you want to answer or not. It's like, how many threats do you get on a daily or a weekly basis? So, I mean, especially, okay, the threats are worse when the government is most unstable. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. after Sheraton, oh God, it was so common that when they couldn't get me, then they went after my siblings. When they couldn't go after my siblings, they went after my parents. I think my parents uh, went to MACC or the police like more than me. Because <laughs> oh, they know wow. when they cannot crack me, they'll crack those around me. Right. Um, and it was one year and a half and like almost every week there'll be something. Mm-hmm. And uh, it will always be offers first. They'll offer you a ministerial portfolio. They'll offer you GLC positions. Um, and then when that doesn't work, and then come the threats. And the threats will come from many different routes. I think I went to the police station like almost every month I'll go there. Confirm yeah. will be called up. Um, so I, I don't know how many phones of mine are still there. Every oh. time they call, they call me out and they'll take my phone. Until today, they haven't returned it. <laughs> when I spoke up about the death in custody on the late Ganapathy, mm-hmm. such a simple video. And then they took my phone until today. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to charge me or not. If you want to charge, charge lah, right? I mean, I, I'm facing so many charges. Charge me. I'll deal with it in court. I have faith in our judiciary. So, uh, I think on this, it will be, there will be a lot. Um, but, one thing which I learned as well, and I always say this to those who face the same troubles as I do, as long as the heart is in the right place, all will go well. Right? I mean, no matter where you are at, no matter whether you are in government, out of government, whether you are facing threats left, right and the centre, or even if you are in prison, but if your heart is in the right place and you know that you are doing the right thing, then no one can control your emotions, no one can control your reactions because you are the ultimate controller of it. So I'm very comfortable being where I'm at because I believe in the cause which I'm fighting for. So you, you, you portray yourself as a very confident, uh, very strong-headed person. At any point in time, you felt really vulnerable and kind of like, oh man, this is not for me. Oh, many... Th- okay, first you may see me as very strong-headed. Uh... I have made many mistakes in my life and I'm, I will openly say that. So while I'm strong headed, the worst thing you want to be is to be an arrogant politician to not being able to admit that you've made mistakes and you need to improve from those mistakes. Um, but at the same time, I've obviously had many moments of vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, one uh, which I could recall very vividly was during the time of Sheraton when the government was about to change because it came from a party which I helped co-founded. Mm-hmm. And uh, in many of the meetings when it was discussed, I fought against it so hard and I never thought that in the end it could tilt and climax that way and when it happened I felt so powerless and I really thought screw this right I'm going to quit politics uh, this is not for me 
Um, I cannot sleep at night. I do, I do we. Because, I mean, I just told you, I also have very close ties with them. And while I disagree with them heatedly, they are still those who brought me into politics. Mm-hmm. Nancy Muhyiddin actually brought me into politics. Mm-hmm. To knock the money, give me a chance to work with him as a researcher before I was finally fielded as a candidate. So, and then all my close friends in politics, people like, Hana, you all on the other side, I get so confused. And all are offering. I mean, I'm telling you during the time of Shadon that one week everyone's collecting SDs, the offers which were made, and I still have it, because some, I don't know why they offer on WhatsApp. It's there. But I'm like, what the hell? So in the end, I just took some time to think, what is the best way forward? I mean, Felica, I want to try to get everyone together, save BH. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I tried to do until the final moment, until we lost. And uh, Tan Shimudin was appointed as a prime minister. But at that moment, I was so vulnerable, I thought, enough is enough. Mm-hmm. I'm going to leave. What changed me was, I mean, if I give up, I mean, what moral standing do I have to tell the other Malaysians out there who are facing much, much worse that Malaysia is still worth fighting for? Mm. Oh no, you just have to deal with it, right? And move forward. And the next day is a new day. That's one. Second one, you should remember, which was very close, this was before elections. Uh, it was, I think, October, November uh, 2017. Mm-hmm. I thought I come from a low middle class family. Mom is a teacher. And it's always been my dream to enter Oxford University. Yep. What more entering with a scholarship? I can never enter without a scholarship. I don't have the money. Almost half a million. Um, and when I got in and then I got scholarship as well, I was so happy and excited. I remember I told Tone, Tan Sri, Dr. Sri that uh, I will take a step back. Um, I want to pursue my studies. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. My parents were obviously excited. My mom in particular, you know, if your mom, Cikgu, oh, yeah. super excited. <laughs> but what changed was, I think this one, I really have to thank Amno for being vicious. <laughs> She's very weird. <laughs> I was already about to go. I made the plans already. I already sent the email saying confirming, all of this. And then they went to threaten my family because they thought that I would not go because I was still making statements against the government. I was still joining all the protests, rallies. So then when they couldn't get to me, they went after my mo- uh, sorry, my dad and my brother. Some mm-hmm. things, the threats, is like, it's very personal, I can't mention, but the threats which could split my family. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, what in the world are you doing? right? And, and I felt it was so personal, so evil, that they're willing to go after those who are close to me in such the most pernicious of ways. And I thought, I cannot leave. And I cannot, I mean, I can just imagine I'm going to Oxford studying my master's in public policy and I'm always thinking what's happening back at home, that if they could do, they could go so low to go after my family, which has nothing to do with politics, and in the most vicious and personal of ways, any other Malaysian can be subjected to the same threats as I do. Mm-hmm. So, to be honest, it's because of them I changed my mind. I said, screw this, I'm not going to Oxford. Oxford can wait. Uh, I'll postpone it. Um, and I did. And uh, I continued to fight and... To be honest, that's one of the best decisions uh, which I made until today. Wow. Okay. Sacrifice. It's, it's one of your many sacrifices that you're basically willing to basically go all over your country. La. Yes, but I'm telling you that many other Malaysians will sacrifice so much more. They, they, they will. They will. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they will. Malaysia is a beautiful place, to be honest. Be- yeah. The people love each other. They take care of each other. But it's like only just a little small bunch. Uh, sometimes, you know, when they have news that are very... Uh, very not nice to see and stuff like that. They tend to like, oh, you know, they tend to question and have yep. this conversation and stuff like that. But like for me, as I remember growing up in Malaysia, it was growing up with an awesome bunch of friends, yep. awesome community. You know, we play with everyone. Yep. I, but I feel like right now, I, there, it, there's still that actually. There's, yep. there's nothing has changed. But it kind of feels like as though people are forced to talk about, oh, like as if things have changed. Yep. But to be honest, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I can't say for much because I, you know, yep. I'm not a, I'm not a person who reads so much. But like for me, it's, it's good having you here to have this conversation. It's a like, pleasure, and thank you for having me. I hope I won't get into yeah. trouble. <laughs> okay, no, nah, la, okay, I won't la. get into trouble. <laughs> no problem, la. Okay, la, let's talk, let's not talk about politics anymore, la. Okay, yeah. so these are a few questions that you know. Again, my team decided to come up because you know <laughs> they they wanted to know what 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 is the day in the life of Syed Sadiq. Interview Ayo. after interview after uh, interview. No, la, it's not, 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 not interviews all the time. Because I, I actually have a set schedule which I have practiced since before I joined politics. Mm-hmm. I do not want to lose that because it keeps me sane. I'll wake up early in the morning doing my toilet. It is quite humiliating. But during my to- I I enjoy my private toilet time <laughs> to do all my reading. So my toilet time, immediately when I open my phone, 
uh, I've learned not to open WhatsApp because that brings a lot of stress. <laughs> <laughs> I'll immediately read my BBC Al Jazeera, the international press. Right. And then um, uh, after that, obviously go to work and every day there are different things. Uh, but noon, I must read my local press. At night, I must do in-depth research on a particular topic. Right. Okay, so let's say now it's about flights. I'm going to do in-depth research about it. So every day, there's a different topic which I research on. Uh, I love my exercise routine. So I must do three times a day. Yeah. It's not long. But it's 30 minutes quick exercise. When I go jogging and exercise, I will listen to my Economist audio version on speed mode 1.5. <laughs> so I can finish it very quickly. I watch Netflix on 1.5. People make fun of me, but I get... Through all the series, very fairly quickly. I think it's, it's it's not it's not it's not too bad because they don't they don't chipmunk the voice. So yeah, you yeah. know, at least it's still 1. okay. Five is still okay. Two uh, one point, yeah, two is still like <laughs> oh gone case like this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You cycle too, right? I see like yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah, like you know, my bunch of friends cycle with you, and I'm yeah. like, what? Hey, what? <laughs> Then yeah. I'm like, oh, maybe I should cycle here, but maybe not. He, yeah, looks, yeah. he looks fitter than me. He no, is no, no, quite no. Fit. Trust me, my cycling is nowhere as good as. I think the, the friends we're talking about, they are so much, so much better. <laughs> I cycle for fun. If they start talking about, oh, you do a 70, 80 kilometer, I say bye-bye. Oh. Yeah, I want to cycle my 30 kilometer and then makan after that. You oh, know? man. That's my experience. So I, I exercise a lot so that I can eat even more. <laughs> oh. I enjoy my good Malaysian oily food uh, 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 uh. Um, but I'll make up with exercising even more la. and that's not necessarily the the the, the solution of to it not. yeah of course it's not I, got, I just recently because I did that because I, I cycle a lot and I exercise a lot yeah. thinking like never mind la, the more you exercise you can eat anything you want so yeah. I had fried chicken for like one week uh, no, okay, not one week, three times a week yeah. and stuff like that and eat whatever I wanted. So yeah. I went for a doctor's checkup. They looked at me and said, oh, cholesterol ni majab man, ya, tinggi. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, it's okay. Well, I exercise. No, that's not the right way to think <laughs> about <laughs> it. Yeah. So even the fittest person, the most ripped person, if they don't juggle their diet, can get cholesterol yeah. and heart problems as well. To uh, be yeah. fair, your doctor is 100% right. But yes. in life, there are many sins. This is one of my sins. <laughs> like, so pick my battles, right? So you know, there are so many things I have to sacrifice. I do not want to sacrifice this. La. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this one is also, uh, this one is for the machis out there and all the uh, ladies who always double tap your pictures and stuff like that. La, la size, uh, they actually have a personal relationship with any pers- anyone Ayyoh. special out there. No? Yeah, yeah. La, I have to ask. <laughs> I, you've been asked this a lot of, a lot of times, but yeah, you yeah. always dodge it, you know, this, but like for me. This is, uh, this is the only one, the only question which I usually dodge. Why? Uh, why? Uh? Whenever I talk about this issue, uh, I actually show one release, but I actually had this long Utusan interview. Yeah. And I was answering all the most serious of questions. And then this question was asked and I answered. Yeah. That became the headline. <laughs> I swear to God, I was so angry. I'm like, hey, I spent one hour with you. <laughs> Why did that become the headline? You know, got all the other things, you know, we can get it uh, another time with you. This one we cannot. <laughs> so this one I will evade. And also, I w- always believe that, yeah, my life is fairly open and public. Yeah. But I don't want others close to me uh, to be forced into the public sphere when uh, they don't want to. Not anybody can handle it. and Not everybody can yeah. handle it. Actually, and to be honest, no one should be able, to sh- no one should hand- try to handle it. Lah. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I can face uh, all the threats, but I don't want others to, to go through the same. Right. Do you read books? What are, what are the top three books uh, that Ooh. you continuously go back to? Holy, um, Grail. Holy Grail. Holy Grail. Huh? Um, so for fiction, I really love um, any books from Khalid Osaini my favourite is The Kite Runner mm-hmm. second is A Thousand Splendid Sons actually both are like damn good um, so those are two of my best fiction the biography close to home which I like to refer and always gives me a lot of energy I should read uh, Robert Kwok's book it's damn good because it's super relevant not just to business but mm-hmm. to politics as well mm-hmm. and how things were done then uh, these are three yeah I did I say autobiography is that one. I mean, there are a lot more uh, Obama's recent book. But the ones which I really love reading time after time again because my my short reading schedules are a lot of fact-based articles. So when I read a book, I want it to be fiction. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I really like Khalid Osaini. Okay. Um, if, if anyone comes up to me and asks me what to read, I'll always recommend for them to read A Thousand Splendid Sons or The Kite Runner. Right. Now, you, you met a lot of people in your, in your career. Who's that one person until the day... When you meet that person, you'd be like, oh man, this is surreal. Hmm, surreal. Um, there are a few, but the one which I appreciate, because it's not just that moment, the moment carries until today, is uh, President Jokowi. Mm. Yeah, because it happened at the time where I never thought it would happen. I was just appointed as a minister one week or two weeks in. I was a nobody, yep. the most junior of ministers among cabinet portfolios. And suddenly, I was invited to go to Indonesia to see him. And he was the most humble 
of persons. I mean, he bought me his car. We went bowling. Bowling? So, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's a better bowler than me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is really sad as a sports minister losing to him. Uh-huh. Uh, but <laughs> but he's a... He's a Hey, it's okay. I mean, the pictures of you jogging <laughs> with your team makes up for it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a he's a really humble guy. But what I really like is that I mean, it's not just it's not a photo ops thing, you know. Mm-hmm. He was very focused. He was he really wanted to know why was I appointed. Mm-hmm. I was very young uh, because he was about to go through his re-election, and he said that if he were to be re-elected, he will appoint someone young in the Indonesian cabinet as well because that has never happened, mm-hmm. and he followed through. Uh-huh. Nadi Makarim, the founder of Gojek, a close friend, was also appointed yep. uh, into cabinet. And uh, sad part is, now they're doing so much better. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I have, I mean, so I think in the future, I mean, now he has already, now he will no longer contest anymore. Um, he, Indonesia will play a huge role in shaping global politics. The fact that um, during the Russian-Ukraine crisis, he went to see Putin while maintaining good ties with the Western world. Mm-hmm. And now, soon in Bali, they will be hosting both uh, President Xi Jinping and President Putin. I mean, that should be that should have been Malaysia. That was Malaysia in the 1990s, you know. Mm-hmm. We were the magnet in Southeast Asia. People yeah. come to us first. Yeah. We will be the deal makers. We will be the negotiators. We will be the peacemakers. Yeah. Do you really see world leaders talking to us? Uh, <laughs> well. So I think that's an answer which speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's funny that you mentioned uh, you met President Jokowi and he was talking about you know why you elected since you're mm. so young. Does age equals experience when it comes to running a country? No, but uh, definitely helps. Experience definitely helps, but it's yep. not summarized only by age. Um, that's why I think in the end, it must. when you talk about diversity, you can't just have a cabinet of young people, only all young. Yep. It's always a diverse. Uh, diversity is about race, age, religion, everything. Um, what makes a team strong is when you have everyone. But if anyone out there says, or oh, you are too young to be the top of this industry, my suggestion is instead of like being super angry at them, channel that into a positive energy into proving them wrong. Mm-hmm. Because I face exactly that. When I run as an MP, oh, you're too young, mentah, tak tahu apa And now I think I've proven to the good people of Moa, even when government cut resources uh, uh, to my constituency, I can still fundraise now almost 3 million ringgit on my own without government funds yep. to help Moa during times of COVID. Um, as a minister, when people said, I mean, you are the junior, the most junior ministers. You can never bring any constitutional amendments, any legislative reforms, because legislative reforms you need the buy-in of everyone. I was able to pass three constitutional amendments in one year, mm-hmm. and one which has passed three different governments, and which will stay for the for generations to come, which is only eighteen. Um, but to me, that's most important because I want to prove that young people can do much better if given the chance. Yeah. Um, and the great thing is, I think there are so many good young people in all parties, including my opponents. Uh, I worked closely with Fadi Sha'ari in past. Mm-hmm. He's a decent guy. He's on the same council with me on uh, cannabis, um, ketom, and industrial hemp. He's also the same council on political funding. We have people like Sha'ari Hamdan in Amno. So that's why to me, I learned not to hate things like 100%. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's always about, yeah, I will disagree with them passionately, but always finding common ground where we can work together. Right. But it's always Sometimes it takes a little bit more effort to have them understand, like, right? Of course. It's yeah. okay. I mean, as long as you understand, they don't understand. <laughs> You how, keep on clapping one one side and then slowly <laughs> it will be a two clap. La. How, how inclusive are you with your younger leaders in your community in order, when it comes to decision making? Uh, so I'm I'm driven by my team. So to show one, the best example of this, best example, when Sheraton happened, I had to make a choice. Yep. I called my team leaders, I mean all of them to come together, my yep. officers all to come together and I asked them, picking this path will definitely lead to us losing cabinet portfolio, most likely getting kicked out from the party, most likely getting threatened. But I never thought like, it would be this kind of threat. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Picking the other side means that we can still work on the values we believe in, da, 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 da. So the line was drawn very clearly. When I asked them, absolutely none of them told me, keep your ministerial portfolio so that we can keep our jobs. Because they know if I lose my job, they will lose their jobs. Ah, okay. All of them resoundingly say, don't worry, if we lose our jobs, we'll find another one. To be fair, they're all professionals. So pick the path where we can all sleep peacefully at night. I believe the younger generation these days are more willing to take risks, don't you think? And that's why I think we are a great generation. Yeah, because like, yeah. Um, you know how last time when we go to a job 
and no matter how badly you're treated in the company, I'm not saying I got treated badly, but mm. or if you're not happy there, let's not let's not talk about treated badly. Yep. Okay, maybe the company is great, but you're yep. unhappy there yep. because maybe it's not your career path. You know, you want to be a pilot, but you became an accountant, that kind yep. of thing. But you don't want to leave because it's stability. Yeah. But I feel the younger generation these days are not motivated by money. Mm, they are motivated true. by purpose. That's true. That's yeah. very true. And and uh, for me is I see that a lot uh, within my team. Can I look at them again? <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and for me, it's just, it's funnily it's funny enough because I, I I even though people may think me as young, but I've been around for quite a while. And yep. for them to tell me like, oh, and it, yeah, I know, yes, financial stability, yes, uh, I I they will have money. They yep. want to buy things that they uh, uh they see online, like oh, they yep. want to buy their brand new gadget or whatever. Not, but at the end of the day, money isn't everything. It's purpose. And I'm like, Correct. oh, okay. And that changed my mindset. And for me, it's because I come from a background where. At the end of the day, you have to listen to what I say. But now I am, I am, I am working for for my staff. My staff is not working for me. It's yeah. It's funnily funny that it's come to that. That's uh, true. You know, they help me make the decisions. Rather, I make the decisions That's for true. them. And, and uh, Marissa and myself in many occasions have shouted at me. Oh, I should report him soon <laughs> to the boss, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a. I, I, one more thing that you mentioned also, which was very interesting. You said that, okay, you, uh, you, I asked you about who's the one person you met and until today it feels surreal. So you mentioned that the day, there was one day before that you were complete nobody and all of a sudden you, was, you were signed into a ministerial position. Mm. And then you had the whole bunch of responsibility just poured onto you. It's yeah. just like, it's a day's transition. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll never forget that moment. It must I, have I, been I, overwhelming. Huh? It was unexpected as well. Uh-huh. Okay, remember I told you just now that in 2017, I pushed back my... Yeah my masters so to be fair Oxford gave me the flexibility see you can only postpone once okay, okay. so then obviously uh, postpone I was supposed to go in June July 2018 yeah. so right after I was elected yeah. so I said okay I'll take a short break uh, I'll do online offline hybrid uh, because it's very quick it's only one year I thought I'll go lah. Um, and I also got Shevening scholarship as well yeah. so I said okay and then uh, I'll see told the Prime Minister then, because I was only working as his officer. Yep. I never thought that I'd be made a minister. And to right. be fair, he never revealed that to me. Oh, okay. Right? So when we Surprise! When, 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 <laughs> would, when there was discussions on like who should become ministers, like uh, it was all, all the other parties, right? So I didn't know that I was in the list. So I was like, please make sure that there are young leaders. You know, there are people like Yobi in. And people. So I was, these are all young leaders who are, who, who are amazing. Yeah. Um, but on the seniority, they are not the top leaders. But... Yep. These are people who should give a chance. We cannot, if you just follow the party list, then what will happen to all the young leaders mm-hmm. who are not in, uh, in, in, in position of seniority? So I'm saying all of this, so you're just smiling, smiling, smiling. You know, Tone has a way of like not answering by just smiling. <laughs> uh, so you smile, I'm like, okay, okay. So that means you will listen, okay. And then um, up until a point, I remember uh, I told Oxford again, <laughs> I was going to go, <laughs> confirm my scholarship as well. But okay. And then I was, I remember I was in a plane, I arrived in Kedah. I was in a taxi, I took a cab, going to a friend's wedding. And it was a long cab ride, I think it was like one or two hours ride. So when I was in a cab, suddenly I received like a few calls, this, like, what is it, private number? Not private number, no, no number or something. No number, okay. No number. So I'm like, what the hell is this? So I was talking, I was having this re- really interesting chat with his uncle. So I'm yep. like, I'm not going to pick up the phone now, so I just didn't pick up. And then suddenly, uh, uh, Toon Chief of Staff, who I was working with as well, Tan Sri Bedaria, called me up. And then when I picked up, I'm like, he said, Sadiq, why didn't you pick up uh, the, 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 the Prime Minister's call? I'm like, uh-huh. huh? when? I didn't get this call. He said, no, using the private Pro- Putrajaya line. So it's private. So I didn't know. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. Hey, wait, wait, uh, I'm going to pass the phone to him. No, pass the phone. I was in the cab and the uncle could hear everything. Oh, man. The uncle could hear everything. So then Sadiq said, uh, Sadiq, I want to offer you to be part uh, of cabinet. So I thought, okay, deputy minister. He said, no, uh, as a minister of youth and sports, do you agree? So I'm like, can you please remind me? <laughs> so like, can you please repeat that? I was like, can I talk to a deputy or maybe I misheard? I said, no, Minister of Youth and Sports. I said, obviously, it will be an absolute honour yeah. to be able to serve the cabinet and the public at large. And I said, okay, uh, come, come in as quickly as possible because there was some process which needs to be done. So the first person who found out was uncle. <laughs> <laughs> taxi and I, had, I couldn't tell anyone because the official swearing was be like one or two weeks after. Right, okay. So I, I just kept it under the wraps. I didn't tell anyone. Um, until the day where I was sworn in. Um, so I'll never forget that moment, but I remember immediately when I got the call, there was, I went back, I had a list of things I want to do. Okay. 
uh, which I had the chance to do. Every contract must be done through open tender. I wanted to be the first minister to declare my assets. I want to mm-hmm. get only 18 and automatic in. I want to ensure that I get paid internships, start with government and move to private sector. So I was listing all down and then in the list of priorities, which one I'll get first, which one I won't. Um, so yeah. Oh wow, that's crazy. Did, did, were there, I mean, obviously you, you were not expected to... Were you expected to know everything top down bottom when you no. basically no right? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> yeah. How does you, how does one handle that? I mean, like, oh man, it must. Uh, well, it's life changing. It's life changing, mm. and 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 you're still here, so that's a that's a good thing. Yeah. If 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 anything, what kept me alive in politics is that I feel super passionate when I talk about change and policies. Yeah. Instead of playing the same old internal bickering or internal politics, that really makes me want to quit. Yeah, I I mean like I I would say like I speak on behalf. I wouldn't speak. It, I mean, I, can I say that I speak on behalf of Malaysians? But for me, on behalf of Malaysia, I feel I I feel that we hope that you could help fight for the better. Definitely, N- we will do it together. N- not not alone. That's for yep. sure. And not only with your own party, but with all parties. Yes. Where if you mentioned bipartisanship mm. and stuff like that, say, well, I sound like I'm so smart now. But actually, to be honest, I don't even understand politics that detail. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I want to feel like I'm smart, but actually I'm not. That's why you know we have side over here telling us everything. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 an honor to have you on the show. I, 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 I hope this won't be the last. Definitely, whenever. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, before we just wrap this up, you know, do you want to say anything to our little, our big Malaysians audience who are listening in today? Yeah. Um, so I'll summarize with a one minute message. Yep. Um, I know a lot of you may feel a sense of pessimism that Malaysia is hopeless. If you're given a chance, you want to leave. Politics is toxic, divisive and dirty. My message is this. We can choose to leave politics, but politics will never ever leave us alone. It affects our jobs, our livelihoods, our parents, our income, our education, everything which we hold dearly to ourselves. If you love to go to a concert, politics can affect your ability to go to a concert. You love to enjoy your personal sins, politics can affect your personal sins. It affects everything. Instead of allowing others who turn up to vote to define politics and the Malaysia which you live in, we should take ownership of it. This is our country. We will inherit it. Vote, come out, and make sure that we define it instead of others. We can do it together. Thank you very much. It's well said. Wow. So that, that was very inspirational. I'll tell you, I see all the people laughing in the back there. You all don't see that because it's the cameras. But you know, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. We hope you guys have taken, taken away something. This is the most politics I've ever talk, uh, spoken about on this, on Mama Sessions. You can stream us on Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on uh, Google Podcasts or anywhere you want to, Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning thank in. Thank you. Thank you very we'll much. We'll speak to you guys next time.